Welcome, wargamers, to the unforgiving tundras of the motherland and beyond as we explore the lore behind one of the most powerful factions in the dystopian age, the Commonwealth. Now, if you're new to this series, the dystopian age is a catch-all term for the alternate history setting that supports the game's dystopian wars and Wild West Exodus, produced by War Cradle Studios over in the UK. The divergence from our established timeline picks up roughly in the early 1800s with the discovery of some alien technology and how that discovery exploded onto the scene to cause dramatic changes in the economics and political climates of the world. In a setting of greed, optimism, and hard ethical choices, and a frightening level of power gifted to the hands of man. Now, while Wild West Exodus focuses almost exclusively on the US, you can see my series on that in the description down below, there are other countries in the world, I'm told. I don't know, there's no evidence for me, but they seem to have the same strife and revolutions and expansions and so on uh, that everyone else had in this very intense time in human history. And to me, few represent that as well as the Commonwealth. So. In this video, we're just going to ask a basic question. What exactly is the Commonwealth and how was it formed from the nations that we recognize today? Well, made up of Russia, Poland, Lithuania, and huge stretches of Mongolia, the Commonwealth is a truly massive superpower on the planet. It's pretty much all of Eastern Europe into Asia. Like it's just an immense amount of land filled with a wired array of geographic and political climates. It's rich in natural resources and raw population. And so in this video, I want to do a bit of a sum up on the foundings of this great nation, but I will say this. If you are a fan of Russian history or World War I history, uh, you should actually read from this book. This is All this lore is from the core book uh, for Dystopian Wars, and I'm going to gloss over some bits in the interest of time, but if you are a nerd like me, uh, you'll really appreciate the name drops and historical references to our real world and all this kinds of stuff. Now, as I said before, this alternate history really picks up in the 1800s, where Tsar Alexander is ruling over an independent Russia. And at this time, Russia is really struggling. They're trying to balance an autocracy, where the Tsars rule with absolute you know, authority, and an elected body that they know as the Duma. And all the while, they want to be taken very seriously amongst the Eastern European nobility, but they can't seem to get a foothold in, right? No matter what marriages they agree to or deals they make, the rest of the aristocrats over on the other side of Europe kind of keep Russia at an arm's length. But the citizens of Russia had a different take, right? So that's the leaders who want to get in good with all the other rich leaders and stuff like that. But the citizens of Russia are like, who cares about the European aristocracy? We have real problems, right? We need food. We need water. Our military is in dire straits and so on. And so that discussion of what Russia really needs took to the forefront as the Imperium, a unified German uh, and center European army that we discussed earlier, invaded. Now we mentioned in this video, in their video, sorry, that this attack on Russia was terrible for the Imperium. But on the other side, the invasion of Russian territory struck deep into the heart of the country and exposed this huge nation as being completely unprepared for war and lacking in just about any form of infrastructure, right? It just, the illusion of, you know, this grand unconquerable land was just shattered for a moment. And while that invasion was repulsed, the seeds of discontent had been sown, and a powerful group of Russian citizens set in motion a plan to enact change. Now I'm gonna yada yada a tiny bit here, but Tsar Alexander dies, and his second son, Constantine, takes over. In our world, it was his son Nicholas, but in this universe he had died of a disease. A civil war occurs under his rule, and the Romanovs are officially removed from their post as rulers in 1830 which led to a massive reform on a government level, but not of a communist sort that happened in our world. They didn't form like the Soviet, they just still had a different type of government in place. Russia still had an office that they called the Tsar, but its power and authority was much more controlled and limited. He could almost be thought of as like the head of an executive branch, rather than like a sole leader and decider for a nation. While the Duma, the elected officials of the people, took the majority of actual policy making. 
the people will speak, the Duma demands, and the Tsar obliges, right? That set of decisions are what dramatically changed Russian history. The people of Russia had lost everything during the costly civil war that saw the Romanovs leave, and they wanted this to be over, right? To reinvest in infrastructure, technology, quality of life, and the state responded, okay? And that's what I mean when I say the people spoke, the Duma demanded of their leader, and their leader, the Tsar, obliges. That's their form of government. Work programs, farming incentives, academic scholarships, and factory positions all began to appear. And the Tsar took a particular focus in modernizing the nation's military. And he basically had a three-word slogan that meant summed up what he wanted. Firepower, armor, and strength. And it seemed as if they were finally on the right track. And then greed reared its ugly head. You see, after a while of people being really happy and things kind of correcting themselves, the Tsar realized he had this shiny new military and the support of the Duma and the people. So... When a small misunderstanding between a Polish ship in the Baltic Sea and a Russian ship, they had a little bit of an accident, a misunderstanding that could be considered an attack on the Russian ship. That narrative was exaggerated. Fate ex fake experts were brought in to testify before the Duma, who were then lied to, which then lied to the people below them. And really what it was is the Tsar was looking for a war. And so when a tiny misunderstanding happened, he exacerbated it to be, oh man, we're being attacked. We need to go mobilize and just go march all over Poland because he had this nice military. He was looking for a war and he got one. You see, part of the old guard, the, the older folks in politics at this time, still wanted, like the previous Tsars, to be taken seriously in the European courts. And the Poland-Lithuania area would be their gateway into Central Europe. However, things did not go well, as the military minds of the Russian army hit a dead stop at Warsaw in Poland. And while the shame of defeat and lies would forever be a blight on the Tsar, world events would see him achieve his ultimate goal. See, even though the invasion of Poland failed, uh, Poland and the Duma still chalked this up to a misunderstanding and one man's greed, right? So they're cool. Like Poland was like, this is just a fishing boat accident that got out of hand. And the Duma was like, oh, you mean we're being lied to? Never mind. We're cool. We're cool. And, and basically like, reparations were paid and that kind of stuff. But all across Europe and really the world, civil war was everywhere. Right. The technological and military achievements based on the discovery of alien technology had finally reached the international stage and become a part of life for many nations. So much power with so many minds manipulating it resulted in the devastation of many governments and people. So with Europe on fire, the Polish king on his deathbed looked back to their neighbor in Russia who seemed stable. Right, Because again, even though the Tsar was a jerk... The government was stable, and basically he asked for a meeting. The power of the Polish-Lithuanian government was offered to the Tsar at the time, it was a different person, the one who invaded, of course, with some demands. But this decision of the Polish government to see the world around them and cling to anything that was stable is what led to the founding of the Commonwealth. See, the territories of Poland and Lithuania were given equal voting power on the Duma as all of Russia, which if you can imagine just the sheer math of that, like the populations of that, it greatly favors Poland and Lithuania in this deal. But seeing as though those two countries brought money and connections to Europe and natural resources, the deal was solid. Later on, the Commonwealth expanded once again, stoking the anger of Mongolian nations uh, for their rejection from the greater empires of Asia they were offered instead to join the Commonwealth, again, for bodies and resources, and they were also given equal say. So what this means is, the Commonwealth as we now know it in the dystopian war's lore is ruled by an elected body of officials, one-third are Russian, one-third are Polish and uh, Lithuanian descent, and one-third are Mongolian, and maintains control across these truly massive territories through the use of smaller and smaller bureaucracies, right? You have your nation, your region, your state, your city, and so on. Each of them with elected officials, their own populace, their own needs, their own strengths, their own weaknesses, but they truly are a unified body, which is something we never quite saw in the real world. So now I'm going to pivot as I always do in these videos and ask the question, 
Why is this so cool? Well, there's a few things going for the Commonwealth here and that one, uh, it is a story ultimately of compassion beating greed, right? Where they just, we had a bunch of problems in Russia in the early 1800s and essentially the people revolted, but in a way that established like, no, we need to be taken care of before we worry about being uh, on the international stage. And that's essentially what it was, even to the point where when the Tsar foolishly invaded Poland for no real reason, he just wanted a war, the country was able to kind of maintain itself and keep together of just like, we just, he's a bad actor, but we need to keep moving forward and make life better. And that was an infectious concept to the idea of Poland, Lithuania, who were like, I want to be a part of that. And so they joined the Commonwealth. Same thing for the Mongolian uh, regions. I'm just like, I want to join you as well, because it's just a, such an infectious amount of, I guess, optimism that you don't really hear about in history, but man, it would be so nice if it existed. But as a unified nation, they have a lot of things going for them, right? Because they have nearly unlimited natural resources. The, the, just the sheer amount of land mass that they own means they have access to so many resources, be it, you know, in terms of water and fishing or mineral deposits or oil and all these kinds of things. It's absolutely astounding the kind of military that they can make. They also have a culture of democracy. So they are a happy people, generally speaking, of course, there's always rougher areas of any kind of country or nation, but uh, there's, you know, everything's elected just about, they are largely considered to be the second most powerful like nation state or, or entity on the planet. And the reason that I, I kind of guesstimate that they're not number one is simply because they're largely landlocked. Um, again, it's a little bit weird. This is a naval combat game. They do have access to uh, different, you know, waterways and passageways, but they are largely landlocked. And really just driving it home at the end here is that when other governments responded to the introduction of this new and crazy technology that was happening all over the world, when that got, when that pin got pulled out of that, you know, intellectual grenade, we'll call it, other governments responded by fracturing. Civil wars were the norm in every single country, uh, especially the US where we almost annihilated ourselves. You can go watch the video on the Union if you want to learn more about that. But essentially, uh, we, we responded by fracturing, but the Commonwealth responded by unifying. And in that sense, you can again see why other nations would be drawn to it. It's it's so interesting to see like, what does it look like for a nation to just rally and survive? And that's exactly what happened here. So any friends, that is my little spiel about the Commonwealth. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the description down below. If you are a history fan, what kind of parts would you like to see? I kind of explored a bit more and let me know your thoughts on dystopian wars as a whole. And I will catch you in my next video. Happy Wargaming.